Um, thank you for showing up this uh, early in the morning for the ethics talks. Um, do I get to see my slides? Uh, oh, they're over here. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's great. Thanks. Okay, um, so uh, I, I'm a transition from yesterday to today, it sounds like, in the way that that was, um, the, the terrain was carved up, maybe. Um, so I'm going to start out with um, my disclosure. Uh, I have nothing to disclose, but when I mention a couple of systems in the talk, um, I, that's not an endorsement. Um, I'm going to talk about social trust and accountability. I'm going to start with the values. Um, then I'm going to talk about two mechanisms for ensuring that, um, explainability and verification. Um, philosophers have had a history of when the public asks them their opinion about things, they don't like the answer, and sometimes they put us to death or other things like that. And so hopefully your reaction won't be quite as extreme today, but I'm not, you'll see, I'm not 100% on the uh, um, explainability is a panacea bandwagon. Um, so I'll try to walk you through why it is I'm not on that bandwagon and why I think we have to put more of our eggs in verifiability than explainability. Um, so I'll talk about some of the uses of, of uh, artificial and machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, maybe carve that up slightly differently um, because my interest is in some of the ethical questions. Um, I'll illustrate the particular challenges that we face in health uh, with some examples. So um, <clears throat> if you think about the human realm, Experts have specialized knowledge on which people depend, and that relationship of dependency um, makes the people who depend on experts vulnerable to exploitation, domination, abuse. So in order to have a fruitful relationship uh, with experts, we want some assurance that what they're doing is advancing the interests of the people uh, who depend on them. Those interests come in two flavors. They're welfare interests, so if you're manufacturing a product, is it safe and effective? Uh, if you're controlling a workplace or an environment, uh, is it safe and commodious? Um, if you're releasing emissions, uh, are they harmful? We also care about people's autonomy. So are you giving them the information that they need to make decisions in the realm in which they're, they're navigating? Um, so uh, are you giving them the information they need to know whether they want to submit to the kind of care that you're proposing? purchase your product, um, whether uh, enable them to navigate environments that they might want to avoid, and so on. Uh, when experts do what they do, uh, their work is not value-free. It's shot through with values. And in machine learning, this is particularly true because the questions that we ask are very often structured by values. We want to know if something is safe or if it's toxic which things we decide to test or not test, which answers we, we decide to ask, those are all structured by values. The constraints on inquiry are structured by values. Is this the sort of thing we can give to a person, or this isn't the sort of thing we can give to a person? Um, is a randomization an acceptable part of a trial design for this sort of thing? That's a value question. Uh, our tolerance for uncertainty and risk. Uh, how much uncertainty can we live with here? Uh, do we prefer type one or type two errors? Um, so what should, what, what should we do to avoid those? Uh, how do we balance the cost of learning from the residual risks that we take? All those are value questions. And if experts make them on their own, then that's a surface through which people can be exploited or dominated or, un or treated unfairly. So we want those things to be ac accessible to people so that they understand the decisions that are being made when those decisions affect them. So we want some reasonable assurance that stakeholders are cooperating in a way that's going to advance the common good, right? You know, you want to make a uh, you want to make a fortune by making a drug that helps people. People who have that disease want a drug that, that helps them out. Clinicians want tools that they can use to help people. So all of these people may have parochial interests, but there's a common uh, end that they're trying to seek. And so part of what effective regulation does is it enables those people to do that with the assurance that one of those stakeholders isn't co-opting that enterprise really for their own personal interests. Okay, so... Um, accountability is an important part of that. So we want to assign responsibility to parties for the relevant aspects of every decision that gets made or element of a process down the line. So uh, who's responsible for figuring out what the goals are that we're trying to achieve, what the constraints are on those goals, what the means are that we're using to achieve them, 
uh, what the strategy and the tactics were for execution, um, who, who, uh, who made the materials, uh, who validated the tests, and so on. So you could see everywhere down the line, right, at, from training, uh, did you have the right personnel? If something goes wrong, you want to be able to say at what part of that surface did the problem arise? Okay, so explanation um, in the professional world is a really important way uh, in many, many, many cases of ensuring accountability because you're reducing informational asymmetries that exist between the professional and the people who rely on them. So you're opening the professional's decision-making to scrutiny and evaluation. And you're making some subject matter knowledge available to the people who are relying on them. So they say, listen, here's why I did what I did. I'm trying to explain it, give you some access into the model or the underlying uh, constraints on the decision. And usually when what you're doing is when, you, when you're relying on explanation, the warrant for explanation, this is the reasons why you should trust them, come from the claims of prior knowledge that the expert has. Explanations are only as good as the knowledge the expert possesses. So <clears throat> let me give you an extreme case, and I think if you are like me and you work with a lot of computer scientists, or your father's an engineer, or your, everybody you know is an engineer, uh, you know, then um, you would be really shocked when you saw what the world of medicine was like. So let's go to the engineering world for a minute. right? If you're a structural engineer, and look, I, this is a little bit oversimplified, but think about you know, within the sort of um, uh, you know, uh, size limits uh, that we're talking about, you face, um, you have a tremendous amount of knowledge. You want to build a bridge. You don't build 50 of them and then wait and see which ones, you know, which ones work, right? You know how soil composition affects that structure. You know how weather and climate affect it. You know tensile strength of the materials and durability. And you know the structural capacities for load. And you know the use case for the bridge. And you know the different design features and so on, and so you know the causal relationships between, you know the variables that matter, you know the causal relationships between those variables, and you can model those things so that if someone says, well, wait a minute, why, why can't I have this span over this really, really large thing? You're like, well, I can show you the biggest span you can have. You know, I can tell you what the counterfactuals are you know, in this system for the different designs. Um, so <clears throat> if this is your model of the world, explanation seems like it's really great. Because then you know what, when you know the variables and the laws that are governing them, explanations put together all kinds of things. When the professional tells you what their goals are, you get insight into the understanding of the expert. That gives you insight into the working of the system in which the expert is working, right? So the expert says, here's why we have to build a bridge this way. Now I can tell you something about the load of this structure or the particular, you know, uh, you know given the, the, the wind in this environment or whatever, they can give you insight into the underlying subject. And um, when you're done with this conversation, you as a stakeholder should know the warrant for the claim that like, this, is, this bridge is going to be a success. Right? You know, this is going to do what, what we want to do. You should have some insight into the understanding of that. Everything is great. So in my drawing now, the, the idea is you know, the experts telling you what they want to do, telling you what the effect on you will be. And that warrant comes from their access into the um, causal knowledge. OK. Um, when you're, let's shift to AI now. So um, the difference between the human expert and artificial intelligence is that the human expert has this, brings this model that comes from knowledge that they have from who knows where, lots of sources. Artificial intelligence in general generates a model from data. And so the model that you get is as good as the data that you use to generate that model. Um, there's a lot in many, not all, but in many, as we, we saw yesterday, in many of the techniques, there's opacity. So the model that gets generated may not be accessible to even the developer. So lots of things, lots of models are used by people who don't understand them, but they, they can rely on the reliability of that model. But in general, those models were generated by somebody who understands them. But in AI, it's entirely possible that you have a model that's generated by a system, and not even the developer of that system understands the model. All of these systems are associationist. So their models represent complex association whose value may differ depending on the use case. And that's an important point that I want to illustrate for you. So very diff there's a big difference between actuarial prediction 
and counterfactual prediction because if, and uh, very often what we want is counterfactual prediction because what we want to know is how to intervene in the world. We want to do something. What's going to happen if we do something? That's very different from just actuarial prediction. And that's what, um, uh, that's one of the distinctions I'll bring out. So um, let's think about different uses now for artificial intelligence. So I borrow this distinction from uh, Miguel Hernan. Um, we're talking about descriptive uses, predictive uses, and interventions. So a lot of times we want to quantify some aspect of the world. Um, that could be, hey, what are the concentrations of particles in a particular location on days of the year? We, we saw an application like that yesterday. Um, but very often in medicine, we want to know something like, what are the relevant variables? So sepsis um, is a condition, uh, a very serious condition of hostess-regulated response to an infection. Um, there was just a paper in um, JAMA last week uh, using machine learning to try to find subsets to sepsis. So we're saying it's not really one thing. There are different subset, subtypes to it. And so this involves using sort of clustering algorithms to try to say what, what's the underlying. So here we, we're saying we think there's one thing. Then we do our, our, our stuff and we find actually there's a couple of things. So instead of knowing already what the relevant partition is over the world, right? What, what's, what things are same and what's different? We're using the system to try to learn that. Same thing, I think, in trying to learn, well, you know, what is, give me a partition or a sense of similarity between different chemicals. Prediction is where we're mapping one set of features of the world onto another. So I have pixels in an image, and I want to map those onto uh, pollution levels that like we saw yesterday. Or uh, I want to take uh, pixels from a retinal image and map that onto a label like diabetic retinopathy. Or I have pixels from a spectrograph, and I want to map that onto chemical composition. Or I have a profile of data of outcomes that are of interest, and so I want to know, well, what's the probability of death for an individual who has this vector of characteristics? Um, you know, if a person has, I'll give you an example later, has pneumonia, given they have this vector of characteristics, what's their probability of death? What's the probability of toxicity given a chemical structure and some large array of features? So now that's not just I want to have a notion of similarity between chemicals. It's that I want to have a notion of similarity that I can use to predict something else, some effect on a biological system. Intervention is a counterfactual thing. What happens to the world if I intervene over here? How will that change the world if I intervene? So the big successes that you hear about from Google with like, say, AlphaGo Zero, uh, you know, where they trained a, a reinforcement learning system to beat all other uh, Go playing systems. Um, this is an example of reinforcement learning. And by the time that system has been trained, uh, it, it can tell you basically the counterfactuals of the game of Go. What if I moved here? Well, then you'd be beaten in 27 moves. You know, um. So um, in, I think the best place where you see machine learning telling you anything about intervention are games. Because there's a structure to games. We know the structure of the board. We know the rules. And you can leverage that structure to, uh, to actually intervene in the world. So you have real reinforcement learning. What if I move here? Uh, then, then what happens? Um, but those results are largely limited, I think, to the world of games, or at least um, in, insofar as we're talking about health. In health, we have to, use, we have to learn this through uh, randomized clinical trials. So here are three challenges of health. So this is where now we, we, I had you in engineering land. Now I'm taking you to medical land. Right? So tumbleweeds are blowing through. Uh, you know, it's... it's um, so our prior knowledge is incomplete and often incorrect. The data that we have might not include a lot of the relevant variables that we care about. So our classifications may not support prediction or intervention, because what we were calling a disease, say sepsis, was really three different things. Or maybe breast cancer is cancer that you have in your breast, but now it turns out, oh, that's probably not the right partition for similarity. There's many, many different you know, uh, underlying genetic and chemical characteristics, and so our classifications change. And our data is often biased. We have differential effects that recapitulate social inequality, for example. And so there are prior filter effects on who you see in the clinic and what their conditions look like, and those prior effects are in your data. So, um, 
when you have this kind of uncertainty and incompleteness, then uh, remember I said for the structural engineer, um, description and prediction intervention, those things lined up. But in this world of uncertainty, these things come apart. You don't know the rules for the system. You're trying to learn them very often. Um, you don't know whether the data captures the relevant variables. Well, that's one of the things often you're trying to learn. Um, and uh, you don't know whether your data is fit for purpose. So now these are the challenges that I want to illustrate. We're thinking about mechanisms of accountability. Because in, in most places in, in health, the, the mechanism that we really rely on uh, is empirical verification. So you estimate safety or efficacy through testing. And then when you do that, the warrant for your claims derives from the study design. If I could tell you, if I had a dollar for every time people say, you know, is it okay to randomize? And it's like, I got to know more than that. <laughs> what are we trying to learn? Uh, you know, what are the interventions? What do we already know? What are the, so uh, lots of these things, it depends. And it, what I'm trying to give you insight into is what does it depend on? So um, you have a study design. What are its operating characteristics? What are the measured effects? And then what, how likely is it that we're going to be able to replicate those effects out in the world? Trials are very highly refined you know, hot houses, and we're trying to learn things so that we know, does it work in principle? Yes, OK, well, now when I go and I treat patients in the clinic, is that going to work? Right? So these are all questions that arise from uh, empirical verification. So think about now uh, some of our problems in medicine. Practical efficacy precedes uh, our knowledge of mechanism very often. So we know that aspirin works as an analgesic, but we don't know why. For 100 years or so, we didn't know why. Um, lithium works as a mood stabilizer, for, but for 50 years or so, uh, we didn't know why. Our theories are often incomplete and incorrect. So um, uh, Hegel said, history is the slaughter bench of human happiness. I like to say cl randomized clinical trials are the slaughter bench of um, uh, <coughs> physiological theories. Um, so we come to the table with the idea that we understand disease mechanism, and we have something ready to go to intervene on that. And then uh, it turns out that we don't know any of those things. So radical mastectomy for a long time. Women had, were subject to this procedure till we did a randomized clinical trial. Turned out it wasn't superior to lumpectomy. Megadoses of vitamins. People really think these are a good idea as anti-cancer. In the carrot trial, the people in the active arm had higher rates of cancer than the people in the control arm, and so on. Um, so a lot of our models uh, drive, uh, you know, models of physiology and drug mechanism drive drug development. But nine out of ten drugs aren't approved for any indication, that summary statistic um, hides the difficulty here, because in some areas, like neurodegenerative disorders, um, nothing works. Um, and even after you've spent uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to bring your drug to phase three, half of the things that come there fail. So part of this is about the unreliability of the theories that, are, that we're using to guide um, what we're doing, and if what you did was rely on explanation, well, people are really confident. And they would say, here, I'll give you the explanation. Here's, the, here's how the disease works, and here's how this is, this, this is what this thing's going to do. And then when we test it, most of the time, it doesn't work. Even after we've done a lot of testing and we get to phase three, half of those things don't work. So the, the, the idea here is we need the empirical testing because of the degree of uncertainty behind us. So in spheres where causal knowledge is incomplete and piecemeal, the warrant for causal claims and assurances of accuracy and reliability have to be grounded in empirical testing. So part of that involves making sure that uh, we have alignment between our data and our methods and our decisions, that we're testing robustness of our data on uh, alternative data sets, and that we have prospective trials that are measuring the, and some of the endpoints that we care about against whatever the relevant standard of care is. Now, that's, a, that's sort of a clinical term. Uh, but I think in, in, the, in the toxicology world, uh, part of this is uh, we can use AI. I think we saw a really good yes, uh, example of this yesterday with John, uh, John Wamba's talk uh, to filter. What, there's lots. There's far more things we could test than we have resources to test. So we can use some of these approaches to narrow down the world to the candidates that we think of as the most promising, uh, 
and then carry out uh, empirical testing. So I'm not a big fan of the idea that we can use these systems to obviate the need for empirical testing. I don't think we're there yet. But I think that we can use these systems to facilitate a more targeted approach for things that uh, might be worth testing. OK, so now I want to give turn to a very concrete example um, where uncertainty matters and where some of my concerns about explainability in this area, I can make them very concrete. So I'm going to take a very famous uh, example now that's used to explain why we need explainability uh, in AI um, from Rich Caruana and colleagues. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking, this is, this is an old study, but um, uh, it was one of the earliest sort of neural net um, um, approaches was one of the systems in here, and it was, it was run alongside some rule-based systems. We were looking at the probability of death for pneumonia from medical records. So I've got here, you know, uh, oops, um, that's fine. Here, this is the laser. So, you know, my interval of, you know, probability from zero to one, and we have patients, and so, you know, these are the characteristics of patients, so they can have, they, they all have pneumonia. Um, so, so this is a patient here, this line. This patient has pneumonia, some vector of characteristics, and asthma. This patient has pneumonia and this vector of characteristics, right? So we have these two different, uh, the representation here is we have these two different patients. And, you know, the, our expectation is, well, if you are this person that has pneumonia and asthma, you should have a higher probability of death. Because if you have a asthma and pneumonia, you're in real trouble. Um, and when they looked in their system, they couldn't look in the neural net because it's opaque. But when they looked in the rule-based system, they saw this. They saw the person with asthma, this vector of characteristics, had a lower probability of death than the person who just had pneumonia. And so they were like, well, wait a minute, that's wrong. And so if, if we had used the opaque system, we wouldn't know that. So um, if we have a transparent system, part of the advantage is we can look under the hood and we can see that there's this error in it, and then we can go in and we can flip that switch, or right? you know, we can toggle that variable, uh, and so we can be more, more, have greater assurance about the reliability of our system. And so what I want to ask now is, let's think about this example. Think very carefully. Let's go slowly and see whether this whole idea about opening up the box and adjusting it really makes the world better. So really what we're looking at is data from a medical record of patients who've been treated. Now, even still, you say, well, look, you know, given, given the same treatment, uh, we would probably expect that the person with asthma was going to be doing worse than the person who didn't have asthma. So the finding is still surprising. Um, but the problem was the people who had asthma were getting very intensive medical care because people knew that these people were really sick. But that wasn't in our data. And so um, the idea here is our data was incomplete. We, just, we didn't have that in there. We couldn't condition on it. And, um, and it's very likely that there were other features that were recorded also, so that if you looked really much deeper, you'd find that there were other people who had other comorbidities and who also got more treatment than you thought and, and so on. The point is, um, the important question here is, what is it that we wanted out of this data? So the, the question that the systems had been trained on was a predictive question. What's the probability of death given asthma and all the stuff we do right now? That's a, that's a, that itself is a black box, right? Just what, if you have asthma and given all the things that we do to you, what's your probability of death? And, or given what's your probability of death given the measured variables in current practice? Well, the system was actuarially correct for that. It turns out if you had asthma, you did relatively well because the people at UPMC were very diligent about giving you the care that you needed. And so that was useful for identifying things like if we have to change the care in our system should, you know, uh, to improve outcomes, should we focus that care, additional care, on people who have asthma? And the answer there would be no. You're doing good there. There's other people who are as close to as sick, but... Um, you know, you're not identifying them, look there. But this system can't tell you how to do that, right? It just tells you what's the probability you're going to die given that you have this vector of characteristics and all the things you do now. What they wanted to know was an interventional question. What's the probability of death given no treatment? Or what's the probability of death given some treatment that isn't standard practice? The data couldn't answer that question. The accuracy of that system was not validated for that question. So my worry is that transparency 
gives us the, the, the veneer or the perception that if we open up the box and we make these changes, we can make systems do things for us they weren't designed to do. So um, when you have a purely predictive system, non-causal correlations, as long as they're ecologically valid, as long as they're stable, they can be really useful. If you have yellow fingers and a vector of other characteristics, that could be a really good predictor of your cancer. If you have pop bump, you know, red bumps on your skin and a fever and some other things like that, I'm like, yeah, that's a good predictor of your chicken pox, even though those things are not, the bumps and the yellow fingers are not causal, uh, you know, they're not causes of your cancer or your chicken pox. So when you have a predictive system, the challenge is to verify how is these conditional probabilities that we rely on for the prediction, how are we going to make sure in every case where we use that system that those conditional probabilities are also there so that the accuracy we saw in testing will be replicated in the world where we use it? Well, in some cases, that'll be easier than others. Diabetic retinopathy case is probably one where that's going to be relatively easy. So IDXDR is a system, the first standalone system approved by FDA to be used to diagnose diabetic retinopathy without, uh, not in the hands of, a, of an expert. It can just be used by people in the, in the clinic who are not eye experts. Uh, Golshan and colleagues have a fully opaque approach. So the IDXDR is a hybrid system. It uses convolutional neural nets to identify specific pathologies that experts want to identify. Um, and then feeds the, that information into more of an expert system. Golshin and colleagues from uh, uh, DeepMind, they just feed the image of the retina into a convolutional neural network and let it use whatever information is in that image to uh, output a label of more than mild diabetic retinopathy or not. But the idea here is um, understanding the model the AI uses in this case is probably not necessary. What is necessary is knowing, was the test medically indicated? Because um, the fact that you're using AI doesn't mean you don't have to remember everything that you learned about the methodology for testing. Uh, because if the, okay. Um, was the best test used? Well, here we want validation of performance relative to the best alternative. If you tell me this test is more accurate than I am, I can tell you what I'm looking at to some degree. The system can't tell you, but it's far more accurate than I am. Were the conditions of testing comparable to those necessary to achieve accuracy? Right? We need to know those. And uh, were the staff adequately trained and so on? So that's that surface. And you can have that surface of responsibility without uh, being able to understand exactly what the model is that the system is, is using. And when it, when we, And in this case in particular, the human sensitivity, so the probability that uh, when the human says you have diabetic retinopathy, that you actually have diabetic, sorry, when you actually have diabetic retinopathy, the probability that the human says you actually have diabetic retinopathy in prior studies was 33%, 34%, as high as 73%. IDXDR, the point estimate was 87%. So even if we don't understand the model, uh, the reliability of that model across the, its applications uh, looks like it's far higher than you know, the average clinician that you might encounter in practice. That's very different. So that I'm giving you there, all you're doing, that's a predictive case. All you're doing is saying, I want to go from pixels to a label. That's different from intervention. There are non-causal correlations. So yesterday, we, there, was a, there, there was a talk about um, um, surrogate markers. Well, in a certain sense, we have to ask, what do we want out of our surrogate markers? If all we want is prediction, okay, it's fine. It doesn't matter where they are in the causal system. They can be, they can be effects, but they might still be reliable as an indicator that you have a particular disease or something like that. But as soon as what we want is to intervene, then, then we have to know, um, uh, not, then non-causal correlations aren't going to help us. If I get rid of the, the yellow stains on your fingers, I'm not... Uh, going to do anything to affect your cancer. And if I you know, su you know, put salve on the, the bumps on your skin, that will relieve the symptom, but it's not doing anything to the underlying virus. Well, electronic medical records are, um, some people say, a disaster, um, but uh, they're often confounded. They're often incomplete. And so in this case, it's 
uh, it's, and I don't know what, I mean, I hear part of what we can talk about is what, what is the quality of the data that's in the toxicological databases that everybody was talking about yesterday. I don't know about the degree to which those are similarly incomplete or unreliable. Um, but the challenge is it's easy to generate hypotheses, uh, but validating those will require some testing in the real world. So I just you know, give one e e example here because um, I think it's important to sort of um, you know, illustrate the points. So um, Komarkowski and colleagues have this paper um, in Nature Medicine for off-policy reinforcement learning to construct a model for optimal uh, care in sepsis. And so reinforcement learning, when I read that, I was like, oh my, you're like, wow, like reinforcement learning, how are they actually doing you know, learning from experience uh, in patients who have sepsis, right? And it's, well, it's off policy. So um, they're not actually intervening in the world and seeing the causal consequences. You know, they take a, the large database, they divide it up, a lot of interesting decisions go into um, dividing, um, you know, uh, patients, uh, you know, uh, characteristics, um, you know, because a lot of these things are sort of smooth and you have to chop them up into, into chunks. And so you, know, you have to differentiate the treatments that people get and um, uh, the patient characteristics. And then you have to define some utility that you're maximizing, some reward for the system. Like you, know, you did well if you get survival at 14 days. Um, so we're looking for models that have the best survival at 14 days. Um, and you know, my, my, my only worry here is, so. Um, uh, Gottsman and colleagues have this lovely paper, uh, you know, ex examining some of the questions about, um, you know, what are problems with this sort of approach. And I'm just, I just picked one or two. You know, one of them is that in sepsis, the data that we have are really sparse in time. So it's not like something where every intervention that you make, uh, you see its effect on, say, you know, if, if you had blood pressure, some continuous measure, and then you, you were changing the fluids in a person's body, you might see in real time their change in blood pressure. But here, you're making many, many decisions, uh, and then the reward is happening, the signal for reward is happening 14 days later. So it's, it's going to be hard to tease out which of those individual decisions was it that was, that was responsible for, for what you did. Also, there's probably a lot of collinearities. There's a probably a lot of, uh, there are probably very few really sick people who didn't get very aggressive treatment. Um, and there's probably a lot of, uh, there's probably not that, yeah. So, um, so it, it, in, whereas in some of your chemical databases, if you think about um, doses, you might have um, data for doses, you know, for a huge wide range of doses. But in some databases, you might, you know, every sick person might have had the same intervention. And so you don't get to see what happened if we had, they had a different, less aggressive intervention. Um, the confounding in the underlying data isn't controlled either. So, you know, this is just a simple example where if you have treatment and adherence, so positively associated, and those are negatively associated with outcomes, so the most adherent people have the worst outcome, then you might think, well, you know, then that, that shows us, like, it's the clearest picture of where that intervention was really used, and it didn't do so well. But, you know, if disease severity is a common cause of you getting the treatment, of you adhering to the treatment, and of your outcome, which is not unreasonable because very often what happens is you're most adherent when you realize you're really in trouble. You're like, this something's really bad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick, to my, stick to my meds. Well, you know, that can be a case where the treatment actually does work. It's just that you were so sick, we couldn't really see it. So in that case, right, because of confounding, um, you, you wouldn't know uh, that the treatment works and the, the, lots of the data that you have going into your system can be subject to this kind of confounding. So the outputs, I think, of this sort of system, they're a hypothesis. They can say, given the data we have, there's a hypothesis that this would be a, a strategy worth looking at. Um, and, uh, but in order to know whether that really is the optimal strategy, we have to test it. And, and to Komarkowski and colleagues' credit, you know, they, they say as much. Um, it's, there are other people, though, I think, who want to, so it's usually not the people doing these studies, but it's other people who sometimes say, well, you know, um, we, we can do the, all, this anal, you know, um, all this work now. Uh, it obviates the need for empirical testing. Uh, at least in this part of the world of health, I don't think we're there yet. So there, I don't think there's one size fits all recipe for ethically acceptable AI. I think different learning tasks pose different challenges. 
Um, different data sets can support different kinds of inference. And it's always important to ask, what are the alternatives? If we don't use this, like, what, you know, what are the alternatives we have? Could we get more reliable information or, or better data? You, you, just because you need it doesn't mean that you can wizard a, uh, a, a method that's going to do better. Um, so we're, we're often in a world of you know, least worst alternatives. Um, and accountability, very often, less about uh, tell me how the model works and more about what's the learning task uh, um, or the problem to address. Uh, why was this method the right one? So a lot of the really interesting stuff we saw yesterday was the right way to do things. Here I have a problem and I found a method suited to the problem. There are a lot of people running around with a method looking for problems. And usually that's where trouble arises. So um, you want it, we want the justification for the choice of method uh, relative to the alternatives. What are the known limitations in your data? And what, are your, what is your expectation for and plan for to try to mitigate some of the unknowns uh, in your data? What are the limitations of the methods that you're using? What are the strategies for validating the results? And what is the warrant? Uh, how do we get warrant for the idea that we can replicate those results when we're not in the clinic, you know, or when we're not in testing, and we move this out into some other domain? So explainability, I think, isn't a panacea. And in fact, uh, too much reliance on explainability will give you false confidence, because all of the things that we believe with a lot of confidence that turn out to be false just get given to you as the explanation. But there's no guarantee that that's going to predict what happens in the world when you intervene. So I think we have to avoid false dichotomies between AI methods and empirical testing. I think what we have to do is seize the opportunity to integrate um, artificial intelligence machine learning methods with uh, empirical testing so that we are screening, looking for the right places to intervene where we're going to have the, the best bang for our buck. Thank you.